Hello everyone, I'm Miranda and today I'm going to speak a little bit about Sofia Kovalevskaya, who was a Russian mathematician. She did the majority of her work in Sweden where she was actually the first female to hold a full professorship at a university in Northern Europe. And she was also the first female to receive a MARN doctoral degree from a European university and as well as being a winner of the pre Bourdin Prize in Mathematics, as well as being the first woman to be an editor for a scientific journal, which was Acta Mathematica, which is actually still in publication today. Now, there is a lot of information out there about her, and her life story is just fascinating. I could go on for a very long time about her, but today, be, for the sake of time, I am just going to be covering the first part of her life. And the reason for, that I chose to go into detail on the first part of her life is because this will give a backdrop to the great mathematician that she would become later in life. While most of her great accomplishments such as winning the pre Bourdin Prize and holding a professorship would come at, at towards the end of her life, which would actually be quite short. She only lived to be 41. Um, this early part of her life really shaped her mathematical interests and the kind of mathematician that she would become. For that matter, the majority of resources I could find out there on her, though there were lots of secondary sources, the primary sources that I found most available to me were books that were written by her about her childhood. So I'll, a lot of the resources I incorporated into this presentation and my paper on her were actually written by her about her life. So it's great that we have these resources where we can hear her life story from her. So knowing that, let's hop right into it. So Sofia Kovalevskaya began her life living in Kaluga, which was a city southwest of Moscow. And while she was living here, she would move when she was about 11, but in her early childhood, her uncle Piotr would regularly come to visit them at their house in Kaluga, and he would stay with them for months at a time. And it was from him that she got her first introduction into the world of mathematics. Piotr was self-taught and he loved to read. She uh, talked about how he would enjoy coming and spending just hours in their library. And while he was in their library, he and Sophia would regularly have conversations about what he was learning about, what he had learned about, and what he was interested in. And on occasion, these conversations would veer into the topic of mathematics. Uh, in one of her books, she specifically recalls that they discussed the topics of squaring the circle and asymptotes. And so while she may not have exactly understood these topics at the time, they would influence her choices in what she enjoyed learning about in mathematics later in life. When she was 11, as I said, they moved from Kaluga to the countryside. And whenever they got there, the house needed to be re-wallpapered. And so the parents, her parents got through wallpapering most of the house, but the children's rooms, they have ran out of wallpaper. So rather than sending off to St. Petersburg to get more wallpaper, which uh, she said in her book, A Russian Childhood, that St. Petersburg was 500 versts away. Now, I had not heard of a verse before, but I pulled it up and I found 
that 500 verse converts into about 533.4 kilometers or 331.4 miles away. So we're located here in Charleston at Eastern Illinois University. So for reference, um, for 334 or 331.4 miles, that would be about the same distance as traveling to Memphis, Tennessee for wallpaper or Columbus, Ohio, somewhere between those two distances. And I don't know about any of you, but I would not be willing to drive that far for wallpaper. Thankfully, we can go to Walmart or Ace right down the road to get that. But that wasn't the case for the uh, uh, Sophia's family. So they decided rather than paying to go get more wallpaper, they would just paper the children's walls with the pa regular paper that they had in the attic. They had newspapers and old books. And by chance, the papers that were used to cover Sophia's wall were the pages of lithographed lecture notes for, I'm going to struggle with this name, but I will try, Ostrogretsky's course on differential and integral calculus, which her father had studied whenever he was a young army officer. So these pictures here on my screen of the mathematical equations and proofs. Um, I could not find pictures of the book that was used to um, paper Sophia's wall, but these were a proof uh, on Wikipedia of Ostrogodzinski's um, derivation of his divergence theorem. And while I don't know that at 11, I would have necessarily enjoyed looking at calculus on my bedroom wall. Sophia seems to have really enjoyed it. She would spend hours staring at these symbols and equations, though she admitted that she could make no sense of them. And some of these symbols she even recognized from the conversation she had had with her uncle. And she said that though she couldn't make sense of them, something seemed to lure her towards this occupation of mathematics. Now, as she grew older um, and got into her schooling years, she was first taught mathematics by a man named Yosef Malievich. And he said that, or she said that she wasn't terribly fond of arithmetic due to her uncle's conversations with her. She actually preferred the more abstract ideas related to mathematics. And early on, her father had asked her if she enjoyed her studies of arithmetic, and she actually told him no. But soon, after a couple months of study, she said she very much enjoyed it. And Malevich, after teaching her arithmetic, also taught her elementary ideas of geometry and algebra. And she began showing that she was more interested in the algebraic ideas than the geome geometric ones, which later in her life, her, the majority of her work would become uh, abstract algebra ideas. As she grew older and grew and grew as a mathematician, um, her father didn't approve of an educated woman. So at a certain point, he ended her lessons with Malievich. However, from Malievich, she did get a copy of Borden's algebra course. And since her father didn't approve an, of an educated woman and her governess, pro would have told him if she had caught her reading that. She would read the book and work the problems at night. A few years later, she also got a physics textbook from a neighbor who was a professor. Professor, oh boy. I've read this name many times, but I've not had to say it out loud. So again, uh, I hope you will excuse me if I mispronounce it. Tritov, 
So Professor Tritov had given her this textbook and as she was reading through it, she saw that it contained trigonometric formulas, which she didn't understand. So she asked her old teacher, um, Malievich, who responded that he couldn't help her because since he had just been teaching her basic arithmetic, algebra, uh, and geometry ideas, that trig formulas were out of his depth. So since she couldn't get a response from Malievich, she used a chord to approximate the sine of the angles and which worked quite well actually as the angles were very small. So whenever she went back to Professor Tritov and began talking to him about reading the book, he was a little bit skeptical that she had read it in the detail that she claimed to. But whenever she began talking about how she had approximated the trig formulas with using the chord, he immediately went to her father and told him that he needed to allow Sophia to continue her education in math. That she even compared her to Pascal, saying that she needed to continue this and that she could do very well in it. And so her father agreed, though hesitantly, to allow her to take lessons from another professor, Alexander Strenolevsky. I'm so sorry, I, I am bad with name pronunciation, so I apologize. But um, whenever she was taking these lessons, which began when she was 15, he began teaching her differential calculus. And whenever she was learning these and they were talking about limits, she found that the limit came to her very naturally. And the professor even said that she had understood them just as though she had known them before. And she attributed this to the hours she spent as a young girl looking at all the pages on her wall and said even that the concept of a limit seemed to have been familiar to her, her for a long time. So she continued her education to the point that it would have been time for her to pursue a degree or go to college. However, she could not attend a university in Russia as they did not permit women to enter them at the time. So she decided she would have to go abroad. But in order to go abroad, she would have to get married because it would have been seen as improper at the time for a woman to travel abroad alone. So she, at, in 1868, at age 18, she married Vladimir Kovalevsky. And there has been debate as to the degree, I guess you would say, that they were married, though there was very likely some affection between the two of them, and they did have a daughter together, and she was very upset at his death. Researchers tend to agree that this marriage was more for the sake of her to be able to go abroad to uh, continue her education than anything. It was more of a marriage of convenience and necessity. So once they were married, they traveled to Germany where Sophia was able to enroll in the University of Heidelberg with her husband's permission because as a woman, she would have to have her husband's permission to attend university courses. And while she was attending courses in, at Heidelberg, um, her husband actually went to another university to study classes in geology. After some time at Heidelberg, she decided that she wanted to go further with her scholastic endeavors. And so she moved to Berlin and attempted to attend the University of Berlin but she ran into Beva Hiccup there and um, 
what the university refused to admit her because she was a woman. And she was around 20 years old at the time. So this picture of her was taken around the time she was 20. So this is how Sophia would have looked around the time we are discussing. And so after being unable to enter the University of Berlin, she uh, in next went to the University of Göttingen and ran into the same issue that they would not allow her to attend courses as she was a woman. But at the University of Göttingen, there was a professor named Karl Weierstrass, and she went to him and asked to take private lessons from him. And initially, he was hesitant to agree. So he gave her a list of problems to solve, which were quite challenging. And I found different sources which said either it was a sort of entrance exam and other ones that said that it was meant to be problems that were so challenging that he assumed that she would not be able to solve them and thus would just never return. But regardless of what the intent behind these problems were, Sophia did return to him with solutions about a week later and her solutions impressed him so much that he agreed to teach her privately. So he began teaching her the same things that he taught in his university lectures. And uh, throughout her uh, time with him, they would grow quite close and uh, uh, form a friendship that would last until the end of Sophia's life. After a few years of studying with Weierstrass, um, in 1874, he began to arrange for Sophia to submit three papers to the University of Göttingen in order to receive her doctoral degree. And he was actually able to get them to waive the oral examination portion that would typically have accompanied a doctoral degree for her as well. So her three papers that she presented were on elliptic integrals, the dynamics of Saturn's rings, and one on partial differential equations. And the one she presented on partial differential equations actually included what would become known as the kochi kovalevskaya theorem. And it um, included what the theorem included what Kochi had proved before a specific case of the theorem earlier in the century, but Kovalevskaya had proved it in full in this paper. And uh, this, theorem, er, this theorem and her proof showed the local existence and uniqueness for analytic partial differential equations associated with Kochi initial value problems. So these are the three papers she presented. After receiving her doctoral degree, Kovalevskaya and her husband returned to Russia for a few years, and it was at this point that they had her daughter. And, and their time in Russia was difficult for them financially, as neither of them were able to get a job at a university where they would have used their respective degrees. And so at one point, Kovale or Sophia left um, Vladimir. Vladimir was stayed in Russia where uh, Sophia went abroad to visit first Weierstrass in Germany and then on to Paris in France to visit her sister. And while she was in Paris, uh, that her husband died. He, with all the financial troubles, they were dealing with, he had committed suicide. And uh, Sophia was very saddened by this. She spent the next several days just locked in her room, refusing to eat or drink. And eventually she slipped into a coma. After she woke up though, the first thing she did was ask for her writing implements and began working mathematical problems from her bed. So a few different people have debated what would have happened had Vladimir 
continued to live and her, him and Sophia lived as husband and wife. Even Weirstrass had written a letter indicating that he believed that Vladimir would have held back her mathematical career. So it's a debate whether her marriage would have helped her in the long term or harmed her mathematical career. A few months after her husband's death, um, Sophia traveled to Stockholm where she began her career as a professor at Stockholm University. So this is where I will leave off with her story. Though she had many of her greatest accomplishments during her time in Stockholm, she became a very successful professor who was loved by her students and wrote award-winning papers applying abstract algebra to physics. This presentation, more than anything, was meant to supplement my paper by going into more detail about her childhood and her student years and telling a few stories that unfortunately just wouldn't fit into my paper for the sake of it not being extremely long. So up here I just have a few of my references and uh, further readings for those who are interested. I highly recommend any of these books. The Roger Cook um, book, The Mathematics of Sonia Kovalevskaya, because I found in my research that just about everyone has a different way to spell her name. Um, so that one goes into much more detail about um, her mathematical papers, the um, Kovalevskaya, or Kochi Kovalevskaya theorem, and her later mathematical work. So that is a fantastic resource for anyone who's interested in learning more about her life. And then the uh, one, her Rus the A Russian Childhood, um, that one I enjoyed a lot. That one was written by her. And then also her recollections of childhood is actually available free online um, thanks to Hadi Trust. So that one is easily accessible to anyone where the, a Russian childhood you might have to get at a library. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation and I hope, hope you enjoyed it and if you did, I hope you will continue to read more about her or learn more about her because she is a fascinating woman and was a wonderful mathematician. Thank you.